thanks Trevor and welcome everybody today. This is a, I'm Irene Butiman, so just to explain, I work between the Improvement Service and, and Public Health Scotland and I have been leading on the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme. Um, and to get to this point, to be able to share with a planning skills event, all that we've done is it's a proud moment for us as a team, actually, because uh, we've always been part of the, the planning skills series and, and inputting into it. And it's lovely to be able to come to it with, with work that I've been fortunate enough to lead and fortunate to enough to have a fantastic team that have, that have done the work that we're, we're going to be able to present on today. Um, if I'll just move away then from that menti, hopefully everybody's got their, their QR code then. I'm just going to share a presentation and initially just set out what we're going to cover today, what we'll be going through for you and sharing with you. What are we going to cover today? And what I really want to start with actually is, is some context of why does the work that we've been doing on Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme even matter to um, those of you that are joining us, us today for a planning skills event. Um, have a little look at that context for planning in particular and, uh, and Scotland's place in wellbeing outcomes and how they contribute into that uh, context for planning and what we're doing at the moment moving forward and only after really having a look at that will we have a look at the programme itself, what we did and how it can now be in a position to help beyond the areas that we've been in and working with for the past three years and with that we'll look specifically at the data that we collected, an important element right now for data driven um, policies in our local development plans and evidence reports and then also the decision making processes and, and how we um, supported those processes to consider the data and to consider impact on place and, and the place and wellbeing outcomes. Fortunately for me and for you, um, it won't just be myself speaking. Um, I am joined by a panel of those that have been involved in the work um, over the years that, that we've been preparing this. So Laura Stewart is with us from, who is the Shaping Places for Wellbeing project lead in Fraserburgh. So up working with the, the health board and the council up in Aberdeenshire area. Um, I'm also joined by Andrew Whittet, who is the Shaping Places for Wellbeing project lead for Brother Glen. So that's working with South Lanarkshire Council and the, the local health board there. And I'm um, delighted to be joined by Tony Finn, who is the Planning and Building Standards Manager at South Lanarkshire Council, who's been working with us from the onset, really, of, of us going in and having Brother Glen as a, a project town. Later on, I'll also be being joined by Tom Fowler, who's a, a principal information analyst in Public Health Scotland, and he has been helping us in a number of our towns with that data element. So he's just going to give us a little bit of a rundown of not just what did we do, but where are we, where are we moving forward with what are our future plans to be able to continue to support planning authorities and councils um, moving forward as well. So, as I say, I just I want to get into the the meat of why this program even matters, and and that context then leads us into why the program then also developed. So, getting right down to where we are, following on from the two thousand and nineteen um, planning act, is that we had for the first time a, a new a purpose for the planning system to manage the, the development and use of land in the long term public interest. And for myself, it was that long term public interest that, that grabbed my attention back in 2019 and in the lead up to it, where we knew that that was coming. Because how do you decide what that long term public interest is? Is it those that shout the loudest um, or is it those that um, are really very busy just getting on with life? And it's for us to to use other means to find out what their needs are from, from their places. So that is that beginning context. The Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme feeds into that. What is that long term public interest in determining what that is for all of us across Scotland on managing the development and use of land? But then we also have an else. else I think it's, I, I had to take this straight from the Act. It seems a boring thing to do to actually take a bit of text out of a, out of a planning Act. 
But it's just to be absolutely clear that th these are the elements that the new outcomes that planning is now being asked to deliver upon within the national planning framework. So previously, it was always about growth of some sort um, with a, a different adjective in front of it. And now we are being asked to deliver on a set of additional outcomes. And the key ones that, that resonate for the Shape and Places for Wellbeing programme are around improving health and well-being of people. Um, and also about improving equality and eliminating discrimination. And that improving of equality, particularly when we think of Scotland with the worst health inequalities in the whole of Western Europe, is a really key one for us. And inequality in health leads to inequality economically as well. The two are so intrinsically linked. So with those new outcomes ahead of us, um, that is the reason for going ahead and beginning to, to think about how do we link all of this up around what planning are doing and what health are doing. We've also, all of us, got the ask on planning authorities to produce an evidence report. And I've, I've handily copied this out of Fife's evidence report that I believe is going to committee this week because it's a nice tidied up version of what it is that we're being asked to include. And the two parts that I've highlighted there are those asks about health. Again, it's about what is the, the health of the population in the area and then the, the, the needs of the, the population in that area area in respect of health and how development and use of land um, can help with those health needs. So those are the, the two elements when we think about the work of the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme and the work being done around evidence reports. How can we be feeding into those asks that are also coming at the local development plan process as well? So with all of that coming towards us in planning and a national planning framework that puts a, a, an immense emphasis on place and place-based working, the programme delivers an approach on how to take that place-based approach. And very quickly, just to, to summarise, a, a lot of what the programme looks at is, is to make sure we're considering our unintended consequences of the decisions that we're making, that we are actually improving health and well-being and that we are actually reducing the inequalities that, that we're experiencing in Scotland at the moment. A well-known quote from way back in 2012 on this is, is that obesity, inactivity, depression and loss of community hasn't happened to us. Rather, we legislated, we subsidised and we planned for it. And that is not with anybody going out to plan and legislate with the intention of exacerbating health um, impact or health or inequalities. It's simply doing the very best around one ambition without considering the other. An example, just to give that little focus about place and, and the role of planning in, in how we have an impact on that. It's just this one route, this journey that, that an individual takes, stepping out of their door in the morning, dropping their child at school, dropping into the shops, popping something into an, an, an elderly neighbour or an elderly relative and then heading on to work. When we do something as basic as move that school that little bit further away, because for the very best of intentions, we're providing an all singing, all dancing school that's much more sustainable and more, um, more facilities and better to run and cheaper. We're having an impact on those individuals. And if we don't think about that impact, then what it can mean that is that something has to give for those individuals. Maybe it's that they can't drop in on that elderly neighbour anymore. So we're looking at a social care cost of having to support that person or not be able to let them out of hospital. Or maybe it's that um, you, you can't make that choice not to drip off, drop in on the elderly neighbour because they're a relative that you, you need to drop in on. So then work has to give way. So we're putting people into choices around poverty as well, or a choice that we need to buy that second car and we're aware of people going into and work poverty. And that's the same for any of those uses, those land uses along the top there. If we are building low density housing, people are less likely to get that walk to school because everything is spread out so much that they're getting the car in order to even begin their journey. If we're building retail parks all over the place that are car reliant, then the local businesses fail and those without access to a car are struggling to get access to, to good food, to good quality, reasonably priced food as well. So the different decisions that we're making and the different communities and, and local living that we're including in our local development plans are impacting on those inequalities, on poverty, on ill health, mental health, physical health, as 
we make those decisions each day and as we plan in our local development plans. So we need that evidence to, to, to be there in our evidence reports and we need to be keeping that in mind as we're both making our policies and then deciding um, on applications as well. The impact there of, of just that, that one move of that school has so many um, impacts on social value that suddenly you're looking at um, the impact of people not being able to age in place because they're not supported by neighbours. You're putting people under stress with two care roles and work to manage. And this extra move of a school or, or of retail is having a bigger impact on their lives. You're making complex journeys rather than a, sim a, a simple journey. Um, physical activity, mental health and cognitive skills are not being enabled if, if people aren't out and walking. We're not even adding to that community cohesion. If all we're doing is driving to the school and dropping our, our child off at the school gate, we're not building up the links and, and the people that are hanging around at that gate that we get to know and that support us in our lives. Local business viability is impacted, as is the 20% reduction in car kilometres by 2030. Air quality is impacted and the connections for the, the half of deprived households um, in Scotland that have no access to a car are, are exacerbated. And when we consider that it's a third of all households in Scotland that don't have access to a car anyway. But as soon as we get into a deprived area, it's a half. So we're immediately exacerbating the, the inequality that they're experiencing as well. So that's just to give a picture of this is the link between the planning and the health and the well-being aspects that we're, we're all contributing in. And it's not purely planning that is having that impact. Um, when we look at any place, there's a whole mix of things that are happening. Planning is having its playing its role. And for myself as a planner, I, I believe it could be playing a, a far more important role within councils as being that social, um, sorry, um, the physical iteration of local community planning, that, that we are that element that can be promoting that and that we balance out about the physical place, the financial investment, the digital place that we all live in now doing so much more online and that we're thinking about the people that are sitting at the mid in the middle of that and the impact it has on them the minute they, they step out their front door. And a lot of it is then about behaviour change and, and how we enable that without people even realising that they're, they're behaving differently. So back in 2019, with all of that context happening um, and a particular ask around not just ourselves to be considering health, but uh, an ask around public health to be considering place and this, what they call, what is called in, in public health, the social determinants of health. I think really in, in local government, we call it the place principle. It's the same thing. It's about the importance of the places that we live, work and play. A group of folk came together called now the Place and Wellbeing Collaborative. And those are the organisations that sit on that group. Um, and started to look at how do we work together better on this then, because we both want places to enable health and well-being. Um, so that stemmed into the place and well-being outcomes. What we had a conversation around was, do we even have a consistent set of things that we think need, we need to get right in a place in Scotland? And we couldn't find that, that there was anything. So we went away, we had a look at the evidence that had been used to shape the questions in the place standard tool. We looked at what the World Health Organization was saying and the other public health bodies in the UK. And what we came up with was a set of features, consistent set of features and comprehensive of if you get these things right in a place, then you're enabling those living there to thrive within that place and to experience um, good health and good well-being. So um, those that is the, the, the well-known diagram now that is, is used for the place and well-being outcomes. And I think what we'd like to just do now is I'm going to just stop sharing and pass over to yourself, Trevor. Um, to just do a couple of menti questions to get a feel for the room about that understanding of the place and wellbeing outcomes. There we go, I've stopped. There we go, that should be on screen for everyone now. Oh, I see people already responding to it. I'll leave this up for about 30 seconds to a minute, uh, just, to, just to see the responses. Very positive so far. <laughs> I'm hoping that people are here will have went and read the, the, the place and wellbeing outcomes uh, when we sent out the invite. So 
I'm sure they'll certainly hear it over the course of the next uh, hour and a half if they have not. Very much set this up as an icebreaker. It's, uh, there's no no wrong answer. Um, if you've not heard, you're, <laughs> we won't, you're in the right place. We won't place. be offended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where not everyone will have access to main team. I'm hoping the vast majority have those, so uh, I'll leave it up for a second or two longer. Yeah, I mean, the code's still on the top there if anybody's joined later. Yeah, we've kind of slowed down again, Irene. So, okay, that's that great. vast majority that's are saying yes to the question. Yep, great. Shall I let you share your screen again? Are you? Don't you? I think you've got another oh, yeah. couple of questions. Yeah. Right. Uh, swiftly moving on to the next one. Um, yeah. Follow up in the, the previous one. I, I'm guessing for the majority that have, uh, have you actually used the place and wellbeing outcomes in your work before? Another simple yes, no. There's the cursor to this question. We will be asking for follow up as well in the next question. <laughs> Looking for some examples. Okay, that's um, a bit more interesting. The no, yeah, no, I think that's I think that's understandable because that's what shaping places has been pursuing is is to get them embedded into to being used. I think we had, we had six to answer the previous question. I've got sixty again, which is half the audience. Yes. Um, so following up on that, um, mainly the people who have. Have used the place and wellbeing outcomes you worked before. Um, how have you used it? Um, examples of this, just very, very concise examples, would be excellent. And if you've not got an example of work that you've done in the, the past, um, any thoughts on how you might want to use it as well would be, be useful to hear here too. So if you've got an idea of what, what might work well or from what we've heard already. This one will take a, a little bit longer to come up. Oh, that's nice to know. A 20 minute neighborhood strategy. Okay. Place and wellbeing assessment. We'll be hearing more about those later. Oh, the LDB evidence report is actually very interesting to hear. Great. Extra report. A nice, diverse. <laughs> Number yeah, of examples there as well. Um, play standard work. Um, oh, in discussion with the Tenants and Residents Association, was quite not actually heard of that one before. So, hmm. I think the important thing to that we we frequently are highlighting is that whilst the place standard tool has those questions to have a conversation about a place. The place and wellbeing outcomes are, are those features that we want to achieve in a place. So it's setting out what that aspiration is for every place. Yeah, so they so very much mirror each other, but are not the same. There's one comment there, which we will touch upon later uh, during the day, is that how, how, understand how GS can be used to assess them. So that's, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch upon that later on. Um, Evaluate the policy direction of travel as well as like to here. Okay, I think it's kind of slowed down there. I've not, I've not seen any hands up at all. I don't know if you want to take any yeah, comments no, at this point. That's fantastic. That's it's it's interesting just to see how others have been using it. That's great. Thank you. And to see that there's such a broad understanding of them also is is really encouraging. I'll start to share my my screen again if that's okay, Trevor. Okay. Yeah, uh, just a little live and rub it. The mentee board is still going to be live, so I'll just leave that in the background if you do want to, to comment anything after this. I'll just let Irene share her screen. Thank you. It looks like we're back to your first slide, Irene. Oh, it's going to let me resume. That's lovely. That was very handy. Yeah, yeah so um, 
for those of you who have heard of them and for those who have not, it's really just that element of, I think the important element is that the place and wellbeing outcomes have evidence behind them. It's not just a set of, of features that a group of folk got together and thought, oh, this seems like the important stuff. Um, it was pulled together from all of the evidence and research that Public Health Scotland had collected in order to set the questions for the place standard tool. And they have now updated that report. And I think that's the, the important aspect. So when you're looking at any of the outcomes and how to achieve them and how to undertake an intervention on them, then rather than having to wait to see the impact that might have on health and well-being, on um, climate change and on sustainability, there is a raft of evidence that already shows us that. So for myself, that's, that's a crucial aspect that it, it means that we're not sitting looking for change. We already know the impact of these interventions um, for every one of the, the place and wellbeing outcomes. On the website, the Improvement Service website, there is a briefing paper that gives a lot more information on them if you're, you're wanting to learn a little bit more about how to use them as well. The actual content of them is within that, that document as well, so you can see the actual wording that, that we've been using and the aspiration behind them. Um, the evidence is, is an important aspect, and this slide shows the sort of evidence that, that sits behind just one of them around active travel, that it, it reads across into what is the direct Im impact on physical activity, weight loss, producing obesity, on impact around um, improving mental health, on improving, um, there we go, about a third of households not having access to a car, thus access to walking and cycling is all the more important for them. So it gives us that kind of evidence that um, within the programme we found that we can end up using in committee reports, policy documents, funding applications. It's it's there and it can be used and it's it, it can really bring to life why we're actually pursuing those those outcomes as well. Sitting behind that, we are also developing a set of indicators for those outcomes. Now, that came about at the request, as it shows there in that first bullet of heads of planning who asked for a set of indicators. And they have been drafted and were sent out to all planning authorities in December asking for comments. That work is ongoing for us. We're not by any means finished with those indicators. There's more to be done. Um, and we would be happy to engage with, with planning authorities around how they've found those indicators so far. Um, and they go back to that place and wellbeing collaborative group that I talked about earlier. Um, the, indi the indicators themselves at the moment gives it, give us information such as what's up on the screen right now, high level information about active travel within the council area that you can then see how you're comparing with other areas and can be giving you insight on your provision of that particular outcome at a council wide um, level. Full recognition that there's local detail to be added to those as well as we move forward. Another reason why the place and wellbeing outcomes and the indicators are important is they're being looked at and used within the National Planning Improvement Framework um, work where they're looking at the attributes of a high performing planning authority. And within that, they have split those attributes into five themes. And that final place theme that you can see on the right hand side is, is looking at the place and well-being outcomes um, as its indicators and its prompts for how we deliver on quality rather than purely on speed and numbers, which is what the planning performance frameworks have tended to focus in on in the past. And a new desire to also be focusing on the quality quality. So the place and well-being outcomes and those indicators are being used as we're, as we're moving forward and that is being um, trialled in particular areas at the moment. So that was a whistle-stop tour of the place and well-being outcomes. What I'd like to do is come to our panel now just for their own reflections on the value that they've found from having those outcomes within their work. Um, and so initially, could I come to you, Laura, um, Laura Stewart, as I said, is our project lead uh, for the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme in Fraserborough. Um, Laura, what, what have been your reflections of the, the place and wellbeing outcomes and their, their value? Thanks, Irene. Um, so, yeah, we've used the place and wellbeing outcomes in the work in Fraserborough. Um, and what it's allowed us to do is to have um, 
conversations across the local authority organization but also with our partners with a consistent language which has been really useful and um, places a hot topic for a lot of public um, sector organizations but there's not a common language often and um, so we're not we're not talking about the same thing we're not talking about the same approaches we're not talking about the same features of a place and that's what the place and well-being outcomes have allowed so that when those conversations are, are being are being undertaken, that they people are talking the same language and also that it provides a, a holistic framework. It's not one specific part of place. It's not one aspect of it. It's not just about spatial elements. It's not just about community aspects. It's the whole the holistic approach to place, which has been really important within those conversations as well. And I think thirdly, it combine some of the key theories that underpin place-based approaches so it doesn't just consider the influence of the people and um, the capacity of people the sense of community the motivation it considers the systems within a place and it considers the structures so the, the place will be an outcomes combines those sort of key theories behind place-based approaches and allows for all of them to have a place in that discussion as well which i think has been really important Lovely. Thank you, Laura. And I think what you highlight there is, is, is there's no one organisation or one part of an organisation that can deliver these great places or the place and wellbeing outcomes. Therefore, they drive that collaborative approach that, that we are all talking about taking. They enable that to, to happen as well. Thanks. Um, can I come next to Tony Finn um, from South Lanarkshire? Tony, what's, what have your reflections been since beginning to work with them? Thanks, Amy. Um, I think the, the, one of the key things has been the importance of, a bit like Laura said, the collaboration with other services and partners. We, we've got, um, I think, with the rest of the other project towns, we've got um, an officer working group set up, and the the organisations and services involved in that. So you've got the community engagement team within the council involved in that, and in in NHS Lanarkshire. Um, we've also got economic development, who are, who are um, a key part of that. Um, Clyde Gateway as well, who are a major organisation trying to bring together um, investment in, in a fairly deprived area in, in Rutherglen. So all those things, I think, they've, they've drawn together to, to be able to allow us to look at things collaboratively. Um, there's, there's been some really good work going on round about that. Um, as an example, um, just put it out there, the Council and Clyde Gateway recently got um, UK level up funding over £20 million to um, decontaminate a fairly big portion of the Clyde Gateway site. And I'm not saying that certain places or the outcomes were the key driver or the tip and balance to get that funding, but it certainly contributed towards that uh, the really important outcome. I think, secondly, um, it, it allowed us to think about how we engage on uh, our early, early engagement on, and leading up to the evidence report. Um, Obviously, the you mentioned this, um, Irene, that the outcomes are very similar to the place standard tool. So we've tried to think about how we can use the place standard tool, tweak it, just to to try and draw in some of those themes that that, that within the outcomes. Um, and I suppose as well, finally, I mean, it, it's it's highlighted, I think, that some of the things that we deal with, and we deal with planning issues all the time, and we think we know what they are, but some things in there that stewardship um, portion, for example, as well, that probably wouldn't have thought about in each, to any great extent, but we, we know that going forward, we will have to draw draw those things in. So that's been a really useful um, aspect of it as well, I think. Great. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, I think that stewardship aspect comes in when you start to even look at new housing estates and who's got that stewardship of the open space and do residents feel they've got control over it or not? And uh, there are there are aspects right down at that nitty gritty level as well as, as far higher up when you're thinking about open space, open space strategies as well. Um, Andrew, um, Andrew Whittet, who is is our um, Shaping Places for Wellbeing project lead um, in Rutherglen. Can I come to you for your reflections on the value of the outcomes? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I think, um, reflect on the um, Place and Wellbeing outcomes. Um, prior to being the project lead, um, I was the community link lead um, in Rutherglen. So I was having conversations with people uh, based around uh, the Place and Wellbeing outcomes. And I think one of the kind of strongest aspects of them was 
um, seeing community groups take the lead and bringing partners around the table together. Uh, being at the forefront of that, driving the conversations around those place and wellbeing outcomes, um, having them uh, having those themes, the, the overarching themes of movement spaces, uh, and um, having them there to discuss them, it was and getting the qualitative findings from that was, I think, um, a real strength of it, uh, both for the partners but also for the community group as well. And that, as uh, Tony touched on, that that kind of stewardship, that kind of being listened to uh, as well, and being uh, respected and listened to, um, and having their thoughts and ideas heard. Um, I think uh, recently, which is uh, uh, within Rutherglen, um, I'm quite excited about because I, I live in Rutherglen as well. Um, the Those broad themes are being um, kind of included in the consultation part of the Rutherglen Town Centre Action Plan. And uh, I, I apologise, Justine, if you're on the, the call, I don't want to be speaking for you, but um, she, uh, the the plan is looking at how we can take those place and wellbeing outcomes to the people, to the residents of Elgin, and uh, take them further and let them discuss what they actually mean for themselves, which I think will be a really, really interesting part of the process. And seeing uh, those place and wellbeing outcomes embedded in that in that way is, is I think, a, a really exciting time for Elgin, and I think it'll be, I think it, um, it will certainly have a big impact. Lovely, thank you, Andy. Uh, Trevor, have we got any? Questions, reflections, is anything coming through from anybody at the moment? There are no questions in the, the QA function at the moment, Irene. Um, just to okay. encourage people to, to post anything in there and myself and Irene will pick these up and, as, as we go along. Okay, that's great. Right. Having set that context then, what I'll do now is, is get into the, the nitty gritty of what the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme has actually been in and doing. Um, the programme itself has a, an overall ambition about improving not just the well-being of people, but the well-being of the planet, um, whilst also, as we say, reducing inequalities in, in that well-being also. Um, so it's anchored in the embedment of those place and well-being outcomes. That's why we began the work was, OK, we have a set of outcomes now. How do we go away and help and support um, locally to have those embedded in decision making? And in doing that with the outcomes, it is, as I say, it's, it's, it's a triple win. This isn't just about health. This is about health and well-being as one package, climate as a package and health and, and um, economic inequality in our country and as not having the luxury of time to do one and tackle one at a time. And if we're looking at the place and wellbeing outcomes, we're delivering upon all of them. We have that opportunity. But we also have the opportunity to support the delivery of a whole lot of other national asks that we have coming at us at the moment. We're not another ask in town. We're helping and supporting delivering on a range of other aspects, such as those that are, that are up on the screen at the moment. Um, and we deliver with that approach. We flow through from Christie Commission, from the place principle, from public health, social determinants of health, the places we live, work and play. Um, and there we have then the place and wellbeing outcomes as that approach as well. So we're there to, to support with the delivery of what we're already doing. And it's challenging at the moment because we are doing an awful lot of, of firefighting. There's a lot of change. And what we're asking is people to work more together. There is a desire to work more together, but it isn't easy to do that when we've got a lot of um, acute need and lo lowering and lowering resources all the time with, with budget cuts. But that bigger picture for us sits where we've got um, high level documents coming out in Scotland about the fact that we do need to work more together. The um, Leave No One Behind, the State of Health and Health Inequalities in Scotland document that came out last year just said straight up, we don't need a new strategy. We just need to be working together more on what we're doing to sweat those assets and to have joined up resources, coherent policies that talk to each other, to work more with communities. And when we find something that works, to adopt it at scale. And for ourselves with the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme, that's what we want to see happening with that approach yeah. now as we move forward. Likewise, in, in local government, there, the report that was um, published last year by the Improvement Service by a series of chief execs and, and councils about how do we take on the new challenges facing um, local government at the moment. And again, it identified six core things that Solace um, and all chief execs across Scotland are now working towards um, moving into that arena of, again, very similar themes, unlocking community action, partnership, 
working locally and central government relationships, understanding what people need, data informed decisions and um, supporting inequalities intensively. So we're, we're feeding into that high level um, asks that we have and into those high level documents that are saying, let's not do something new again, let's just work together better on, on what we are doing. So how we come in and, and we do that support is within the decision making processes that we're all involved in, whether that be plans, strategies, strategies, proposals, whatever. We start with that what is happening in an area and looking to, to determine what is happening. And we have come in with an approach that has looked at data, quantitative and qualitative data. Um, we then also have what is it that we want to see happening in an area? And that's where we already have the place and well-being outcomes and the, the bank of evidence that tells us this is what we want to see happening in an area. And then finally, at the bottom in that link around is so how do we when we're making a plan or a strategy, or we're basically deciding to intervene in what's currently happening, how do we bring that data and the evidence on what matters in a place into the decisions that we're making? And we've been doing that using processes called a place and wellbeing assessment and also producing outcome briefings. And I'll give a little bit more detail on those um, a little bit later. But these are the towns that we've been in and working with locally. So those decision making processes, we've been supporting each level of those as, as they happen in the round. There's never an ideal time to start these because when you go and work in an area, they're partly through a process. But those are the towns that we've been in and supporting with that. A crucial part of our work has been learning from each other across the seven towns as well um, on our approaches and getting confidence from each other as we go. And we've had a national leadership goal will be fed back up to Scottish Government and to COSLA and to our funders as well. Um, so starting though with data and where we began with um, collating that data, the journey that we went on was looking initially with the support of analysts from Public Health Scotland at the towns, the seven towns that were that were listed in the last slide, um, to determine what are the population groups in these towns that are experiencing inequality. And we identified it down to between about three and five population groups. Uh, and that was a complex set of profiles that came up with that set of, of particular groups that we could then focus in on. And that's why we then produced a quantitative data infographic that would really highlight for all of us what were those particular population groups. An example being in um, Air, where we found that those living in North Air had a 14 year less life expectancy than if you lived in South Air. Really stark figures that brought into an infographic that we could all be using and sharing would help us to bring that information into our decision making in the next meeting, in the meeting next week, in the policy that we're writing next month and, and bring it to life. But an important part for us was also the qualitative information, what people were saying that they needed from their area. So that was um, going in with our community link leads that um, Andy referred to earlier, and that was his, his initial role within Shaping Places, was going in and sense checking what the data told us with what people were telling us and with what community organisations and stakeholder groups were telling us those that were experiencing inequality needed from their place. And again, we pulled that into a more visual summary. A lot of the, the work of Shaping Places has been producing these sorts of reports that take data. I am not a data literate person in the slightest. Um, take it into a level where I can understand it and I can be quoting it. Um, and that takes a, a bit of work to, to carry it across into that, that um, level of way of communicating it that uh, the others can, can pick up and run with it that are not analysts themselves. The feedback that we've had from that suite of reports that, that we've um, done in each of our towns when it comes to the quantitative data, it's it's been quoted as being probably one of the best sets of data that, that um, has ever been seen, and that was the health improvement lead in NHS, Ayrshire and Arran. The quantitative data, the feedback there was that the report on what people were experiencing in Aloha in this particular um, circumstance was 
powerful and needed to be shared with everybody making decisions that were that were having an impact in Alloa and therefore on that area that was experiencing the most inequality. So they've been prepared and they've been used and we've taken them into other areas of work as well. But I think that data element um, and that quantitative data and the journey that we've been on, given the, the slide I had up earlier about the fact that we are all preparing evidence reports at the moment. Um, I just wanted to pass on to our um, analyst from Public Health Scotland, Tom Fowler, who has done a lot of the, the work and certainly in three of our towns and had a more broad overview of the work that we've been doing around that data and has been able to, to take what, what um, I found was screeds and screeds of information that made my face go slightly panicky into a format that, that we could make sense of it. And, and Tom's been doing more work around that. And this is, I'd have to say before I put over to Tom, this is a, a, a journey. We're not finished. We're not quite there yet. Um, and how we get to a point of sharing all of this is something that we are, we are now having conversations about and have a subgroup set up to progress it. But I just think it's a great thing to be able to share at the moment when, when folks are looking at the need to bring data and, and on um, public health and health of their area into their evidence reports. So, Tom, will I stop sharing and perhaps you could share a little bit of just the work that you've been doing? Yeah, thanks, Irene. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, as to, to confirm, I've been supporting directly the Dunoon, Fraserburgh and um, Rutherglen, Shape and Places Town. I've uh, been working quite closely with Andrew and Laura. Um, I've got a few slides, a spreadsheet and something a little bit more interactive to share, so it won't be death by PowerPoint, you'll be pleased to hear. Just to summarise and confirm some of the points made earlier through Irene, we've been delivering a quantitative data profile across the community, um, looking at a range of different domains. So this is all using what's available nationally um, on public data sets, so we can leverage this um, and, and start to bring in information and interest across people that may not be utilising some of this data already. The quantitative profiles are there to stimulate the conversation and drive that engagement or drive that commonality of discussion across the table where multiple agencies are sat around. Um, and as one of the quotes earlier um, probably alluded to, you know, we've got a central data profile that is consistent um, between the towns, so we can make some comparisons quickly but also allows for the different partners that are working within the Shape and Places programme to have one point of contact that they can pivot around and starts to enable those slightly more deep dive conversations, which is one of the, the approaches we took within Rutherglen. Um, very aware there is masses of data that is out there across a range of different platforms. Um, we started off with just the top line of um, different places to obtain data. So some of these will be likely more familiar than others. Um, Scotfo would be my data tool of choice from where I've come from, from a health perspective. I've certainly enjoyed getting to know more of the information that's in the CPOP tool or what's available from the Stat Explore from DWMP. Through the evolution of the program, we've started to engage with far, you know, some new data sources as well, based on some feedback or based on some suggestions from colleagues within the town. So Skills Development Scotland are looking at uh, 16 to 19 year old participation for one thing. Uh, no miss for labour statistics, so trying to understand what uh, industries exist and what what um, uh, what volume of jobs located within an area, particularly something interesting within Fraserburgh, um, as an example. And then Cresh uh, for looking at density for potentially health harm outlets, so tobacco and alcohol outlets. How do we start to bring all that data through that we're getting visibility from, from a national agency, into these programmes? So throughout this pro process, we've leveraged some, some existing um, data and code or some understanding from existing products to, to really drive into a low granularity and an intermediate zone level. So it's roughly between three and a half to 5,000 people um, within an intermediate zone uh, to start to give us some comparisons on data measures that are usable. Um, but we can start to make some um, some statements around what's significant or what's significantly significant. So next slide um, is a table of numbers. And you know, I, every time I show this to Irene, <laughs> I can imagine what Irene's uh, face will be. But for me, this is my bread and butter. So within this table, um, we can automate this. So for Fraserburgh, as an example here, huge number of data points. 
at a single point in time, but across a range of different domains that allows us to see here on the horizontal what the comparison is. So the percentage of the population in out of work benefits, uh, we can compare that against the local authority area and Scotland to give us some context about well, is how high is this? Is this high? Um, is there a problem here? Or we can start to scan down and read down the column about an area and the residents that exist that live within the area and what that sort of demographic looked like. So for our, within Harbour and Broadsea, almost three quarters of the uh, population live within the most uh, deprived quintile using the SIM Scottish um, relative um, measurements. We can start to read through and understand the narrative in discussion with the steering group, trying to bring up that knowledge and understanding to, to enable a conversation. So the crime rate for one within Harbour and Broadsea triggered a lot of conversations locally to understand well, what is it that's causing that? What's the local intelligence that really brings the flavour and the actual realism off the paper of, of lots of different data points? So there's, there's a lot here. Um, some of the feedback and comments that we've had is that it allows people to, you know, housing is a good example, um, allows people to, to understand what it is that, you know, from my housing colleagues that have been in some steering groups, they know this data better than I do, but they're not they're not exposed to life expectancy or the rate of early deaths from cancer that might or some of the um, potentially asthma, as an example, or COPD. That might not be data they have at their fingertips or they're familiar with. So how we use these data profiles to bring people together across the agencies has been a really good, interesting conversation. There's another slide, another table of data. Um, but it starts to give you that visibility of so much data that's out there, narrowing in on what's the important factor to look in for an area it takes time, takes the conversation. Those conversations are really rich and they often drive more conversations. And that's a great thing from a data perspective. How do you really dig into this data? How do we drive this from an understanding and awareness to a so how do we do something about it? With these being singular data points, we can start to utilize the history of data that we have. Um, and so within um, within Fraser as well, we can start to, to plot the rate of alcohol admissions over time within three areas within um, Fraser. We can see a reasonable consistent trend um, within um, Central Academy, Harbour, Broadsea and Lockpots, within Smithy Hill and Rose Heart in Strathbeg, very different population. That trend is markedly lower. Again, using some statistical rigor, we can start to then see where do we where can we start to make statements like significantly uh, statistically significant. So we can understand and we can programmatically run this through and understand that the rate of admissions within Central Academy is significantly higher than um, two of the other areas within uh, Fraserburgh and Aberdeenshire. So we can start to make these things of there is a significant inequality within a community that exists here, and it is also significantly worse than Aberdeenshire. So there's a lot of data here. There's a reasonable amount of learning within the team, what learning within the um, the shape and places for work, well-being steering groups, but also how we trigger this off into local teams for what is their local intelligence? What data do we have from um, the local uh, systems that we we don't have access to because uh, you know they are on the local you know, local system only for uh, usage locally rather than from a national agency perspective. With it being data, you know, we can do more. <laughs> we should do more. We don't have to narrow it down for just an area. So something that we've been supporting within Rutherglen in South Lanarkshire is taking that view, exporting into Excel. It gives that opportunity to manually add in your own local data which means something to you it means something to the residents of south lanarkshire or individual communities within south lanarkshire so you can utilize this as an asset rather than just in one position so you can keep scrolling down and we've added new things into this as we've learned more found out things from other towns started to really evolve this as a program um, so things you know there is more here than there was on the previous slides things like the 20 minute neighborhood data and then we can start to again utilize Excel. This is looking at all the areas within Rutherglen Canvas Land. So we've just expanded the areas that we're looking at. It makes it a little bit more challenging to really find the narrative, but it allows us to see at a glance certain data points that might be of interest for the certain local challenges that are being faced. 
and it's just to start. It is there as a conversation. It doesn't have an answer that's going to give you something. Quickly, you can start to pivot on a here is a really high crime rate within uh, one area within Rutherglen compared to the other starts. So what numbers pop off the screen? And that's something that you know takes skill and takes a different mindset from potentially some of the other experience and skills that exist on this call. Again, within Excel, you can start to make make things a little bit more easy to consume. So um, where the data is available, we can highlight where things are significant to South Lanarkshire. So rather than focusing on a pure numbers perspective, we can start to look at where is it significantly higher? Is it significantly lower? Is it good that it's significantly higher or lower? How do we then start to weave this narrative in on things that are consistent across an area? So we see consistently that the bowel screening uptake um, comes up in quite a few of the conversations. The alcohol admissions across shaping places comes up in many different conversations as well. Um, children and young people, some really important factors here around what can we do from a health perspective, from um, prevention, early intervention, dental health is one key aspect. What things need to be thought, sought, uh, thought out about and sought to resolve to support our local children uh, to make better choices within their lives. Within Anything children and young people related, particularly as we're focusing on small communities, we need to be very mindful of how many how many children is that. So the dental health, you know, you're looking at twenties and thirties. So how do you make sure you've got the context of what is a local number within the conversation? Again, this is all multi layered and into something that starts to really drive that deep dive conversation. It's something that we we undertook within Rutherglen within. With, with multiple agencies within the steering group was a three hour workshop where we sat, sat and discussed data within Rutherglen and really honed into what the local context was. And we took the time to really discuss it as opposed to here's your spreadsheet, off you go, figure it out type thing. So that local intelligence, that local interpretation, bringing the agencies together was a really strong factor for, um, for the Rutherglen uh, program. Lots of data there. I'm going to hurry up though, Tom, I'm sure. afraid. Okay. We're, we're running out of time. I'm no sorry. Problems. No problems. One thing, um, as, as Irene alluded to, there's a short life working group as to, well, what can we do more with this? Because this is a static spreadsheet. So one key learning from our aspect is that um, you know, we've come from it from a health perspective where we've been used to time series and trends. What can we do on a map from a planning perspective? How can we visualise things on a map? Um, and this is just a prototype. This is just something that just to drive conversation, but um, something that was really interesting again within Rutherglen, uh, it's, it tends to be my, my go to. Um, I'll just narrow down. We could start to see all the different health measures um, that are in Scotfo, but just displayed slightly differently. Um, Runtime's a bit slow while I'm sharing screen on, on but mapping wise is possible. So I'll just really hone in on Rutherglen just to, to show an example of within Rutherglen um, life expectancy. There's a there's a 10 year difference within between two intermediate zones. So High Cross Hill, the, the life expectancy is 86. Oh, so it's more than 10. So within that, that these two areas within the same community, there's 14 year life expectancy difference uh, for females. And you know, we can start to make things far more engaging, far more interactive, loads of different interactivities rather than here's a spreadsheet, off you go type things. Um, and then you can start to look at from a health perspective, well, what drives this? What things are potentially things that are going to be causing this? So again, yeah, we can start to look at things like alcohol related admissions, um, you know, the colour scale changes. So that rate within Shorefield and Clincart Hill was a lot higher than High Cross Hill. Or might want to look at, um, you know, anything that's here that's potentially of interest for for the communities that are working together to support this. Is there something significantly changing here? And we can start to really, you know, this is something within the short life working group. But what more can we do with this data? You know, that feedback that we get from these programs really helps shape how do we make tools that are effective that are going to help support quick decision and effective decision making. Um, so yeah, that certainly. One one output for today was, well, how do you make these tools work for you? That's fantastic, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. And as I say, that's it's it is a work in progress. Tom's been been working this up and we need to take it back to the place and well-being collaborative to see 
just where, where can we find a home for, for this work? Because at the moment it's, it's a one off, it's not updated or anything. So we're not really in a position to, to share it yet. But I suppose it's just that Tom has um, taken a whole lot of data and turned it into a map. And as a planner, I'm happy. It's like I can make more sense of it in a map. <laughs> Uh, right, what I shall do now, yep, Trevor, sorry, your hand is uh, up. Just a question, I'm guessing what's asked this when Tom's still here, is um, the data use, is it public, publicly available? Uh, people are aware of the SMD, but um, want to know about the other indicators you've uh, taken on board there. Yeah, but by design, everything we've used is published and publicly available. Uh, within the slides, which you can forward on to yourself, Trevor, there are all the, the icons are interactive. And that will drive you through to the sites where we've obtained that from. Perfect, thanks, Tom. Yeah, I think everyone will be happy to see the links and things, and we will share all the links that we've mentioned throughout the presentation as well. Back to you, Eileen. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, from the outset, we were quite determined that everything had to be publicly available and therefore shareable because there was little point in collating all this data and then sitting with it as a steering group, not able to, to circulate it out and around to others. So um, it's been fantastic that it is all there. It's just perhaps not easily accessible by um, all of us who are not analysts and able to, to um, know what exactly what to do with it. I want to just come on to some reflections then very quickly around the data and the value that it has had, both the quantitative and qualitative for um, for the those of us on the panel. Um, Laura, again, can I, I come to you first for your reflections on how valuable that data has, has been within Fraserburgh and Aberdeenshire? Yeah, thanks, Irene, and thanks, Tom. Um, I can listen to Tom talk about data all day, personally, um, and I don't mind the spreadsheets. But um, having Tom's expertise has been fantastic, and I was really fortunate um, that in Aberdeenshire Council we had a lot of data. Um, so the the data that they'd produced and looked at was looking at similar things to what Tom had produced, but the the layout of it was very individual screenshots that compared places, intermediate zones in Fraserburgh to the rest of Aberdeenshire or compared Aberdeenshire to Scotland. And what Tom's work really allowed us to do and was absolutely crucial for us in identifying what was going on in Fraserburgh is it allowed us to look at Fraserburgh compared to Fraserburgh where things didn't get hidden. Um, so it wasn't looking at the whole of Fraserburgh, which is a, definitely a, a tale of two halves when we look at the inequality. I mean, that key measure that Tom pulled out there, you've got one area which is 75% in the highest quintile of deprivation, and then you've got 0% living in that quintile. That, that was hidden in a lot of information, but Tom pulled that out for the intermediate zones and allowed us to explore that. Um, so it was absolutely valuable and sparked the conversation um, and provided a lot of explanation for what's going on. So in Fraserburgh, we'd identified that there was this unwritten north-south divide um, in the town that was causing a lot of issues with the place and, and how effective things were in the place. And then understanding that that was based on intermediate zones and how people were experiencing their life in that town on all of these measures was really important. And um, so that the quantitative data profiles started those conversations and gave almost light bulb moments to a lot of our steering group to understand that so that was really really welcomed and it and it allowed us to understand the data that Aberdeenshire Council had. Tom linked in really willingly with their um, colleagues from the council and you know they sometimes they hold data that answered the questions for us so why were the high levels of COPD in one intermediate zone because that's where all the sheltered housing was it wasn't that there was an issue with specific air quality or anything else that we could have gone down a rabbit warren of looking at, it was because that's where the population that are more likely to have COPD were housed in the town. So it gave us insights combining what Tom was doing with the local information from Aberdeenshire Council and other partners, um, their specific data set. So that was absolutely invaluable. But what I have to say is then we haven't really touched on it yet. The qualitative data, um, and is, is it all right to, to just yeah. dip into that? Yeah, the, the, that's when it came to life, I think, for everyone. And I hope Tom doesn't mind me saying it as well. But I think even for Tom as the analyst for our town, here in the steering group, 
bring those qualitative bits of information forward and the work that the community link lead did that was absolutely crucial because it stopped us going down paths of assumption and um, so we were looking at quantitative information and it was very easy to assume what the problems were and to assume that we understand understood what those problems looked like what the inequalities were what it was like to experience the inequalities but that wasn't the case when we got the qualitative information the context behind behind how people were living with those uh, those inequalities it's things that we couldn't imagine if we're not living it um, and that was absolutely crucial so the qualitative data behind it neither is as valuable without the other i would say they are absolutely crucial to understanding our places fully and that's been our experience of it definitely and for sparking the conversations as well great thank you laura and i think moving forward I, from my reflections for a planning authority we are pulling together quantitative data for evidence reports but that qualitative element is what gives that that sense check and can bring new issues to light and I wonder Andy if you wanted to reflect on that in in Rutherglen the new sort of issues that came to light as a result of looking more qualitatively and having conversations beyond what was available about health data. Yeah absolutely thanks Simon. Yeah very similar to, to Laura um, in, in Rutherglen we're trying to find that balance between the quantitative and the qualitative uh, data gather and just um, rather than a reliance on, on one or the other. But um, so from the outset, uh, the, the quantitative data um, managed to highlight the kind of key inequalities uh, for Rutherglen. So things like the life expectancy that Tom uh, Tom showed, the life expectancy variances, um, children in poverty, alcohol admissions, these kind of things. But those which, which were great to have uh, from a, a kind of level, but on the ground, that's not really what people were talking about. People weren't talking about alcohol admissions unless pressed on, or they weren't, they weren't talking about life expectancy. What they were kind of talking about was the, the kind of mental health and links to uh, poverty, the cost of living, um, carers and resources that um available for them. But but in the case of Rutherglen, which, um, which I think is really interesting, is the, the kind of, the key theme that people were talking about, the key inequality, was the uh, living close to derelict, de derelict land and contaminated land. In the case in some parts of Rutherglen as well. So in that, um, through conversations, uh, through that qualitative gathering of information, that then became a key inequality that perhaps um, may have been missed if we were just relying on the, the quantitative data alone. I'm not saying it would have, but it, it may not have been a, a kind of key inequality to, to jump out because it's not doesn't have the same maybe impact on on a on a level if you if you start seeing like uh, 12 13 years different life expectancy that's a, that's how that jumps out of you whereas the stuff about the the contaminated land and the uh, derelict land is maybe hidden a bit more so it wasn't until you started getting that um local voices um on that and through the steering group as well and um, that that and it started to be reflected and then in, and as Tom mentioned the, the data deep dive that's when we start to look at it deeper and then we start to see actually in Burnhill, 95% of people in Burnhill live within 500 metres of a, of a derelict land. Um, so that and the impact that that will have on people's mental health and well-being, the kind of some of the things they're saying about letting their, their kids uh, out and play, there's the concerns about that. So all these things kind of came through people's local voices that perhaps the, the quantitative data may not have given um, full impact on. Brilliant. Thanks, you, Andy. Um, and I, I know with the, the qualitative information, we went above and beyond, but we did begin by just looking at what existing engagement reports were in the area to get insight initially, as well as then focusing in not on doing a, a traditional engagement um, process. None of our screening groups were looking for us to do that. It was simply having conversations with those community groups and stakeholders that were working with those experiencing inequality that gave us that insight. Um, Tony, can I come to you finally then for your reflections on the, the value of, of the day? And I'm thinking in a with a particular reflection for the, the value for planning authorities as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Irene. Um, I think obviously the time of this is, is really important because um, like a lot of other planning authorities, uh, we're starting on our evidence gathering for the evidence report. Uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say that as a as a council of South Lanarkshire, probably doesn't have the greatest um, data set or or held in one place. So it, 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 it's been difficult to draw together a whole range of information and, and, and facts and figures that we, we needed. But th the work that Tom had done, and, and, he, and he came, he, he gave us two hours of his time um, a couple of months or so ago um, 
to explain to a couple of the team and myself, just going into the background of of, of the data he collected and what it meant. Um, and that I think that was invaluable because for, for me anyway, Sally was I mean, I'm a bit like you, I mean, um, I find tables and tables of figures a bit overwhelming, but other striving this obviously and the forces of some of my team do. But it was good to to understand what that was actually meaning in, in, in that in that context. Um I think um, Andy mentioned there that the, we, we've done some local engagement around about the qualitative side of things, and I think that's been really, really invaluable. And, and it's, I think it's helped us understand different ways, different methods of engaging with people to get that um, that 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 outcome from, from that. So we're, we're looking to see how we, how we can use those conversations that we've kind of had and, and how we can build on those going forward with, with our engagement strategy. Um, so it, it's I suppose that's 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 probably one of the, the key things around about that. The other thing I suppose so we, we focus obviously on, on Rutherglen and um, so far in, in 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 this project. But so South Lancashire, if people don't know it, it's, 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 there's two parts of it. So there's a really heavily populated, densely populated Urban context around about Ramp, Campus Lang, Rutherglen, Glen, East Cabride, Hamilton, and you know, and the data around about that is is you know, it'd be very similar to what we've we've been sharing, at what Tom showed us. But we've got a really large rural area, and we're really interested to see how that's going to pan out when it gets to that level in those smaller settlements. Um, it'd be interesting if there's anybody on the call from say Dunoon, how, how, how they've used their data to. To tease out um, outcomes for the, for the for the rural areas as well, but uh, but yeah, I, mean, I suppose we we're probably just very much at the start of of, of using this data. We're, we're not anywhere near uh, finished our an analysis, but we are creating data profiles and we are going to use that as part of our engagement to sense check, get people to sense check. You know, is this right? And you know, what do you think? So it's been really useful. Um, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that approach to data and, and profiles of, of particular areas. I know that the, the Fife evidence um, report, rather than just giving a list that, that matches with what the, the requirement is for an evidence report, it actually tells a narrative of different settlements, which as soon as you read it, just seems to bring it to life more and give more, more value to it. Um, Laura, I suppose for yourself, as you are a rural area within Aberdeenshire, is do you know if that is an approach? I know we've talked with with peers in the past about him looking at that same kind of narrative around individual parts of the area rather than just a list of data and an evidence report. Um, have you got any reflections on that? I mean, I don't want to speak for Piers. I'm sure he's on the call, um, and I know that yeah, Piers is part he of is that. Actually, or I don't oh, okay, know. He, he might not be. Um, <laughs> he's out. He's on our steering group. So yeah, Piers has been involved in looking at the data and 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 very welcomely challenging us on the data as well to try and push us to explore what what he needed for the evidence report and I have to say that was something that we we were really fortunate because Tom was really open to that and I was just about I was just thinking about that when um Andy and and Tony were speaking about that scaffolding approach to it so the profiles that we produced across the seven towns were fantastic um, and they, they were definitely the starting point, but the ability to scaffold onto those profiles for the specific areas was absolutely um, invaluable as well. So like Tom mentioned about going and looking at the data around employment for Fraserburgh, that was really important because thinking about that rural nature of Fraserburgh, it doesn't have the sort of um, ability to link in with employment in other large areas in Aberdeenshire. It is so far away. It's, you know, hugely expensive to get into Aberdeen and um, the public transport is not supportive of that. So looking for employment opportunities that are in and around Fraserburgh was absolutely key to us understanding inequality in and around Fraserburgh. Um, because people didn't have the options because of the the rural nature of Aberdeenshire, and um, so I do think that's going to be a really important part of of understanding the settlements in Aberdeenshire, the geography of Aberdeenshire, and other and other rural areas across Scotland as well. And um, because it's not it it doesn't work 
in the same as it does in the built up dense denser areas it just the, the opportunities aren't the same the experience of inequality you know we we've talked about it in Aberdeenshire and looked at poverty um is a very real issue in a number of places in Aberdeenshire it gets hidden because Aberdeenshire is a very affluent area for lots of reasons because of the oil in the northeast and things like that so there are pockets of of deprivation and, and specifically poverty um but the solution to that poverty is very unique to the geographical location of those places as well. Some of them are very close to Aberdeen City and maybe have opportunities for employment and connections to Aberdeen City. But places like Fraserburgh, we're going to have to think differently um, just because of the nature of the geography of it. And that's going to be the case a lot of across a lot of Scotland. I know for Argyle and Butte, they've had discussions around that as well in the work in Danoon. And, and, and there are going to be specific challenges that are going to need bespoke solutions and I think that's part of the place and well-being approach and the shaping places approach and the data-led approaches it's not that this will work everywhere in Scotland it's let's look for bespoke solutions to the issues in Scotland and let's learn from them and see if there's learning that can be shared and I think that's been really key for the program as well. Yeah and I think those the evidence reports that that are being prepared now are an opportunity to at least begin that process of building that narrative about the different places within an area rather than and always just the whole council area and a list of data. OK, I'm going to have to move us on because of time. Um, and Trevor, do we have any any questions specific to, to that the, the data aspect? Yep, and we're happy to know it's already been answered in the chat. Uh, there's a question regarding the definition of the intermediate zones. And oh. if you go into the chat, there's a link from Simon Roberts to the Improvement Service Spatial Hub, which has those there, which should be available to, I think, everyone in this call. Um, so, yeah, it's there. There's another question there, which I think actually we might be able to pick up after the next section. It involves marine planning, so just, I'll, I'll bring it up at the appropriate point in a second. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, so if we remember that circle of decision making that I had up as, up as a slide a little while ago about the support that we've been giving, um, and what it is we want to happen, then we've already been through what it is we want to see happening. It's the place and well-being outcomes that, that we've covered within the context. And as I say, there's a there's a full report on those and the background to them as well, if anybody wants more information or the actual content of them. Um, what else I would add in here now then is that when we're looking at what we could see happening, what are the interventions we can be making in order to make things, um, those outcomes be embedded and us all working towards them? That comes back to, to the slides that I had up a little bit earlier. That comes back to using the, the evidence that sits behind all of the place and wellbeing outcomes already um, and also using the indicators as we develop them also. So next part and final part really for today is, is looking at what have we done then when we've we've collated that data, um, both quantitative and qualitative, and we know the things we need to get right in a place, we have evidence that tells us, then how do we bring all of that knowledge into the decisions that we are making every day? A key aspect would be a local development plan, but it also feeds into evidence reports, local place plans, um, and, and the, 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 the raft of other plans that sit around us that have an impact on local development planning as well, the housing plan, the economic strategy, the transport strategy. How do we ensure that those different plans and, and large proposals in our area are taking account of both the data that we know about who's experiencing inequality and the evidence that we know that, you know, what more can we be doing to deliver on the place and wellbeing outcomes? And we've done that using two processes. Primarily within Shaping Places, we've used a process called a place and wellbeing assessment. And then more recently, we have pulled together place and wellbeing outcome briefings, which have, have really pulled together all of that data and evidence that we've just been talking about up until now into a three-page briefing paper that can be shared broadly with everybody and primarily with decision makers, with, with them folks looking for grant funding, with elected members and that bring to life the facts in an area um, into one tidy package per outcome that we can be, be using and referring to also. 
But I'm going to begin by looking at the place and wellbeing assessments that we've undertaken. So, as I say, these have been done where there was a plan, a proposal, a policy, um, an action plan being prepared um, following a, a strategy. Um, and it hadn't yet been finalised. Really, we want to come in and look at that document as early as possible and assess that document for a number of things. One, how does that plan or policy or decision impact? How, what more could it do to promote um, the place at all those features that we know we need to get right in a place? What more could it be doing to um, have a more positive impact on those population groups that are being that are experiencing inequality? And therefore, what more could that plan do to improve its own content, to deliver its own ambition, um, but also to be thinking about that long term preventative role of place. So that has expanded out beyond purely um, planning documents into the raft of documents that are, are listed there. We've now undertaken 30 place and wellbeing assessments. These assessment sessions take a half day, which is, is a big commitment, but compared to any other kind of impact assessment, they are very rapid indeed. Um, and they bring together a range of expertise in the room, the proponent, the writer of the plan, our steering group members and others that we feel would, would um, bring a perspective into the room as well to, to run through that set of questions that I, I was just um, going through. So the scale of types of documents we've looked at, we looked at uh, a neighbourhood plan that was being refreshed by a deprived community in, in Rutherglen. Um, we've also looked at the Fourth Valley Health Board um, healthcare, health strategy. So that's the kind of range, right from a small area of Rutherglen to the whole of the Fourth Valley. Um, we have assessed with that those same series of questions about the impact on those experiencing inequality and how it could do more to deliver on those places. So that can be something as basic as a health and social care strategy, where it has previously talked about prevention. Now, acknowledging the importance of open space in, in pre preventing people having mental health issues and saying that within the plan so that then there's a hook there for a local development plan to be able to link up with that, that coherent policies that we were talking about a way back when I, I was talking about the big picture work that we need to be supporting, plans supporting each other as, as they move forward. And certainly when I think about, well, maybe come on to it, Tony, that um, when we reflect about that Burnhill plan and being able to take it through a place and wellbeing assessment, how much does that mean it's 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 almost a local place plan as well? Are we moving into that? Because there's a real dilemma when you've got neighbourhood action plans and local place plans, how do they all knit together? Um, and if we can do that with as little resource as possible, that would that would be really helpful. So that's the range of of, um, docu of plans that we've assessed. And each time that we did that, we uh, we produced a report of the conversation. So what the folk people in the room came forward with as the changes that that plan could implement, what were the recommendations for change? And they were purely recommendations. It was up to the writer to decide if the timing was right for them. In many cases, it wasn't. But it meant that instead of having those unintended consequences that could lead to exacerbating health and health inequalities, we were aware of them more as we were moving forward. Having done 30 of these, we've also produced a how-to guide so that others can pick up and, and be able to do their own um, assessments. And we are, we're here to support people with that work also moving forward. We also, as I say, um, asked our colleagues in the Improvement Service to review all the recommendations that were coming out from uh, those 30 reports. So a lot of recommendations coming out of them. This, they, they, they did an assessment of, you know, out of the, the themes of movement and spaces and resources and, and so on, what were the most popular recommendations? What were a lot of the recommendations founded in? And it maybe wouldn't surprise us that it's around movement and how people move around their area and how free they have that access to walking and cycling. But when it came to the actual content of the, of the recommendations and what they were asking for, the key areas are up on the screen. So they were about community engagement and consultation around um, the documents and including that more. And then the next ones are very much around those themes that, that come through in those higher level documents across Scotland about partnership working, about 
the, the need to identify the core benefits that if I'm delivering a, a housing plan, how is that helping to also deliver on the, our climate strategy? We're one organisation. Are we linking up together? It can be a challenge to do that, but a health, um, a place and wellbeing assessment process enables you to do that. It gives you the structure to be able to look at both plans as they're coming online and ensure that they are supporting each other as you go. So that whole alignment of other plans and strategies is something that's meant we've we've been reflecting back to our steering groups around that collaborative working and, and back and asking them what what is their governance as they move forward to, to support place-based working? Where does that sit within their organisation to, to give that permission for plans and strategies to be cross-referencing and supporting each other as, as they move forward? As I said, the other tool that we've we found in order to impact on decision making is the, the place and wellbeing outcome briefings that have pulled together the, the evidence um, that we've been referring to behind the place and wellbeing outcomes, have pulled together the, the, the information that is in those even now at the moment draft indicators about council areas and then has pulled in that more qualitative information, that lived experience that really brings to life people and people being the centre of this and, and what they're experiencing as well. We were asked to do these initially in our Clyde Bank steering group and I think now we're actually doing them for all of our steering groups because having seen them you can see the value of, of having just sheer factual information and lived experience of, of frontline workers that's that's been captured and, and how valuable it can be to decision making, grant funding applications and so on. And that's just an example of the, the, Clyde, the first Clyde Bank one. Three pages there that can be shared, can be printed out if you're allowed to do colour um, printing anymore. I'm not sure. I'm sure even in black and white, we could all, all make sense of it also. So they, as I say, are being prepared um, across all of our steering groups now as well. So um, that impact on decision making. Uh, just want to gather our reflections then about the value of, of that aspect. And I, I'm aware that uh, it's potentially more the place and wellbeing assessments. That's been the, the larger part of our work. But, but any thoughts also on those briefings? Tony, can I come to you first just for that reflection on the, the value of the place and wellbeing assessments? I'm thinking because of the particular plans that we've assessed um, with you in, in Rutherglen as well and, and how that's had an impact. Yeah, sure. Um, we, you, did, you did an assessment or we did an assessment of LTP2. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that was a, a, a very much a, a basic refresh of, of LTP1. It wasn't because wasn't, we knew MPF4s come along and all the different different themes, but it was to it was to just to re review and refresh. So when the assessment was carried out, it, we probably had a fairly poor outcome, I think it's fair to say, because the, all the new themes that, that we're dealing with, we've talked about today, just aren't addressed in that in that LDP. Um, so I think don't think that was a surprise as such. I think I'd, I'd kind of warn people in the steam group beforehand that that would be the case. But some really good points came out of it that we're going to take and use, and we are using to to think about how we take take things forward with um, evidence support and everything that, that goes forward with that. One of the things that came out was, um, you know, the, the format, the language that was used was was pretty, uh, you know, it wasn't going to help local people, local communities understand what their plan was was all about. So that's that. I think that was a, a key thing that, that came out of of it. Certainly, you mentioned Ben Hill neighbourhood plan. Um, locality plan and um, in, in anybody else's language. Yeah, we, we met, it was about a year ago. I mean, I think we had that um, even session with them in 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 their in their community building in Burnhill, and it was it was a real eye opener, especially for me. I think to to, to listen to to local people and get, express their concerns. You know, even even at the most simple level, I guess. You know, maintenance of open space and uh, but then going on to Bigger, pick, bigger ticket things such as, you know, we need affordable housing and, and you know, there was no uh, recreation facility or what the one they had was was very poorly looked after. So that was a really interesting um, event, I think, for, for, for me, certainly, and, and, and the, my colleagues that went with me. Um, so, so, yes. Lovely. Thank you, Tony. Um, 
Andy, can I go to you for um, your reflections on, on assessments and, and the briefings? I, I know that you're early in, in preparing those in, in the Rutherglen area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it may be slightly different in terms of the place of well-being assessment. There's maybe a, a kind of unintended consequence or a positive unintended consequence is um, around uh, the, um, the one we did in Burnhill, Burnhill Neighbourhood Plan. Um, on, on the back of that, um, there was contact made, came from the Enterprise and Sustainable Development Services team within South, within South Lanarkshire Council, looking at um, how they can maybe use that to kind of put together a grant, grant basically to the Regeneration Capital Grants Fund. Um, so that that kind of um, grants funding approach that Irene mentioned as well. So they, although they weren't involved in the initial um, uh, assessment meeting, place and wellbeing assessment meeting, it just shows the kind of uh, impact that the report can have on people as a kind of knock on effect um, that people request it. Um, so that that bid had gone in. Um, I'm not sure what the outcome has been yet. I don't know if they've heard yet, um, but it was to build a, a to, to develop a, a derelict site in Burnhill through a net zero build. Um, and in Burnhill, we mentioned earlier that um, there's lots of clusters of um, uh, derelict land or, or vacant buildings, but this was a kind of standalone building. So um, I think it sounds like a really excellent bit of work and um, I'm sure the bid would have gone in, but I think the bid was enhanced through the place and wellbeing assessment and other data and other evidence that was provided with them, as well as connections as well and resources. Lovely. Thank you, Andy. And then finally, Laura, for your reflections on, on the place and wellbeing assessments in, in Fraserburgh and beyond, I think you've been asked to, to do others beyond Fraserburgh. Yeah, so we've we 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 were late to the show and we've only done three assessments. And when I look at the table, I think, oh, we're so far behind. But we've um we've done three assessments specifically in and around Fraserburgh, although one of us ours was a regional one as well. So we did the Aberdeenshire Health and Social Care Partnership Strategic Plan. Um so the assessment process went down really well and the the most positive feedback and consistent feedback was that we gave space to that collaborative discussion across sectors and organisations and, and the participants were welcoming of that to have someone else facilitate that, bring those people together, identify who needed to be around the table and then allow for contribution in that discussion with a re again as i said at the start with a really clear framework around the language that was being used and it was clear what was being discussed around place so that was really helpful um, and that was consistently fed back from our assessments um so i think that's it's it's really important because that discussion allows for expo exploration of opportunity and that was fed back as well it wasn't critical discussion it wasn't a let's pick this apart it, it wasn't negative focused it was an opportunity to explore how can we align it better for place how can we try and deliver these 13 outcomes more effectively more consistently for our community what what more can we do and also it provided opportunity to say actually we're doing this well in some places and that was that was it the, the case it was reinforcing for some aspects as well so it really provided a platform to do all of those things and then one of the assessments in particular we undertook because we wanted to compare it to integrated impact assessment process and how does a place and wellbeing assessment fit in with that? And it was very clear and the feedback from the assessment, um, it's one of our impact statements, I believe, was that the the place and wellbeing assessment should be done as early as possible um, in any in any project, such as I think this was the primary school merging project, and it should be done as early as possible before you complete an integrated impact assessment, because it was felt that by having that discussion with all of those partners that were going to be involved in either the, the delivery or the support of that project, that you could explore the consequences positive and negative consequences and that would inform your integrated impact assessment much better than one person sitting by themselves and going through a checklist and filling that out and thinking about what they might be you explored them and you explored them in depth which meant that you came up with real mitigations as well so the recommendations really identified things that could be done to try and reduce the unintended consequences and that didn't fall to one partner that fell to everyone around the discussion. So th there was confidence in that as well, because it didn't all fall down to Aberdeenshire Council to put all of these mitigations in place. Actually, it recognised we cannot put this mitigation in place, but if we work with our third sector partners, if we work with the primary schools, we can start to put things in place now that will mitigate this unintended, unintended consequence. So 
that was really useful and and the assessments have been really well received and as you say we're working in Fraserburgh but there's a real appetite to do these assessments in other areas of Aberdeenshire now and looking for how can we do that um, the learning estates team have been fa fantastic at trying to drive that forward um, so I, I believe that will be a, a common approach now in Aberdeenshire for looking at these place and wellbeing assessments. In terms of the briefings we're really on as well and um, the, 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 that came out of our recommendation and it was actually before Clydebank had finished well had really started their first one one of our recommendations had identified that they wanted an evidence piece around active travel and Clyde Bank had were, were further ahead than us and we you know went back and said is this the sort of thing you want in terms of this briefing and that is what they wanted so that was the recommendation that they wanted that briefing um so that they could engage communities so it had to be accessible for communities to understand but so that they could engage elected members around making those decisions around these things as well um so those briefings we've worked as a steering group to try and um bring in a priority process for we know which recommendations were identified as needing a briefing but what about the other outcomes so how do we go about prioritizing those and in Fraserburgh we've also got a community champions group and they've voiced which are their priorities as well so now we're working with the steering group and the community champions group to identify how we deliver those outcome briefings with a priority for that community both for those that are trying to make decisions for the community um, at a strategic level, but also for the community and what they want explored for them as well. So we're, we're tallying those two together. And the last thing I will say is it was really interesting in looking at the recommendations, because as you said, Irene, a lot of recommendations come out of these assessments, but these recommendations weren't about you need more money, you need more resource. A lot of them were about you need to join up and collaborate. You need to link your strategic documents. You need to support each other so that if it says it in this document and it says it in this document, it carries more weight. Um, and, and those are really not not easy, but they're really big wins at times without having to spend huge amounts of money, which everyone's being challenged with at the minute. So I think that was really important to identify as well. Lovely. Thank you, Laura. Totally bringing it to light. And it is that aspect that we're preparing these plans and strategies anyway. And being able to, as we do each one, make sure we're linking thing up is, is as I say, it's a half day of getting people together to have that conversation. And when we're trying to do as much as we, we can with limited resource, it isn't actually, that was not whatever came through, was we need more money to be able to do such and such at all. OK, I'm just going to close by sharing a little bit about our impact and our learning over the course of the programme. The, the intention of the programme was to develop an approach that could then be shared and that others could pick up and use across Scotland rather than just in seven areas of Scotland. On the website, we have a, a range of impact stories of, of where we have done work and what difference it has made in each of our towns. There's there's at least at least there's there's more than one impact story where we're collating them all the time now to just give people a flavour for the impact that they can be having around um, getting the, the recommendations into the project brief of a, a leisure centre, a wellbeing hub, um, the air housing strategy now including content on the importance of public travel and active travel um, and community cohesion when they're looking at new affordable housing locations which previously was wasn't mentioned, they were simply going for where there was a site available for affordable housing. Um, so as I say, we've got a, a range of different impacts and there's, there's more on the website um, as well. But I think what's important for us is that at each stage of the work, at each stage of the, the quantitative, the qualitative data and those assessments, we've produced how-to guides as well. And we are still working together across the towns to pull together further learning that we have about what's the optimum way of setting this up and moving forward. Um, should other areas be interested in taking that approach? And just last month, myself and one of our other project leads were up supporting Shetland um, community council, community planning, sorry, um, with a place and wellbeing assessment of an area where they have um, three projects progressing in a relatively small town and want to make sure that they have a joined up approach and collaborative approach on that. And they're, they're joining up on, on what they're doing rather than having any unintended consequences as, as they proceed. So we've got that kind of support there now to, to, to be able to review on the website. 
What next for us, as I say, is that national rollout of our learning and resources that are all sitting there on the website. We do want to, as we say, look at that quantitative data and how we can be doing more about that and that subgroup that, that Tom was referring to earlier. We want to look more at how we help with those delivering of outcomes, those outcome briefings, because for us, that's what engages hearts and minds and change. When you start to see those facts on a page, that's where you can see, ah, I'm doing this for that impact and I am actually somebody who can reduce inequality and improve health and well-being with the day-to-day -day decisions that I'm making. And then that lived experience aspect that we've highlighted through here, the qualitative information, we want to do more around that. That was quite an intensive um, piece of work for us to do. We need to find a way of doing that with less resource given where we are as, as local authorities. But it's it's not something to replace our traditional community engagement processes. It's that little bit extra that makes sure we're reaching those that are experiencing inequality if we want to deliver on that outcome right back at the beginning that's in the 2019 Act. And for ourselves, there is a, a strength and support to planning authorities. Throughout this process, planning authorities have been really waiting on the, the, the regulations and, and the, um, the enactment of the 2019 Act happening. We've had the national planning framework now. Everybody is progressing now with their evidence reports and will be going into their, their um local development plans. So it feels more now that the time is right to be able to support planning authorities also as we as they are moving forward and are at that position. And as as Tony said, um, we've reviewed um, the the previous local development plan and it, no surprises in, in um, South Lanarkshire that there was a lot of things that, that, that hadn't been covered by it. It was of its time and we did the same in Clackman and, and it was of its time, but it was more to be able to go, but here's the kind of structure for the next version as we move forward with a new um, type of, of local development plan as well. But finally, I would say just this quote, an ounce of practice is worth more than tons of preaching. So you've listened to me go on and you've listened to all of our opinions and so on. But I think the important part is, is to have a look at the website, is to pick up the guys, the tools that we've got there and to see if they could help you with what you're dealing with right now and to get in touch if, if there's anything that we can be doing to support that, to explain it, because it's only by getting into looking at those resources and guides um, and having conversations that I think we can we can actually be making sure that we're we're taking on board those asks that are given to us from the 2019 Act and make sure that we are um, including far more evidence and consideration of health and, and inequalities as well. And we believe that the Shaping Places for Wellbeing programme gives you an approach to do that and to take a place-based approach essentially. Um, I'm going to hand over back to Trevor. If there are any questions, we could take them. I'll stop sharing um, and you could perhaps just set up the next Menti. I can see Keith Miller from yep. Middle Orient Council has a question. I will just uh, let Keith come in to speak. Uh, you should be able to, to come in now, Keith, if you want to. Afternoon and what a comprehensive presentation that was Irene <clears throat> I tried not to get lost through it it was an awful lot to take in there and and it was very interesting and by the way I'm at Edinburgh Council not Midlothian so a little bit oh, out of date there just a little a, sorry a Freudian slip <laughs> um, <It was. laughs> what I was trying to get my head around and excuse my ignorance of this we obviously got a lot of processes to do when we're going through the local development plan process uh, one of which is the the SEA process, which has got many stages to go through. And of course, different stages fit in with the different parts of the, the LDP preparation process, um, such as scoping and then drafting and then so on. And review, that's another key part of the process. But what I was trying to get my head around is that there's a lot going for this process and it's how it slots in with the various other parts of the process that we have to go through. And what is the optimal time to do this analysis? Because you I can see the benefit of doing it early on because, you know, in terms of the evidence report, the data that's contained within that, then we can reflect upon that and producing the strategy of the plan. But then there's also the benefit of looking slightly later on and saying, have we got the policies right in the draft plan in order to deliver on these outcomes? So 
that's the that's the challenge I was wrestling with. I was just trying to take this all in. When you've got a very long-winded process, and let's face it, producing an LDP is an extremely long-winded process. When is the best time to carry this out to get the most out of it? I suppose that's my question. It's a very long question, but then it was a long presentation. So I don't have an answer, hence the question. <laughs> what could you no, say? It's, it's, it's a good question, actually, Keith. Um, I would say that, yes, you begin as early as possible but that it shouldn't just be uh, once done and then move on. My ideal would be that it's a process that you do as early as possible, such as um, with Tony in Rutherglen, before you even have the, 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 the thinking of the next plan. That was sim simply looking up at the high level aims and ambitions of the previous plan and how that should change. But it's something that you should be able to come back and do when you've got the next iteration. This is a half day. It's not too onerous, really. And the value of it when you you can then be gathering the thoughts as you're moving forward rather than the traditional approach of my memory of doing a local development plan, which is you prepare the plan in some kind of pretty finalised draft and then you send it off out to, to other people to, to make a comment and they no longer really understand it or the implications. So I think it's an ongoing way of having that conversation with those in, in, in a council even, never mind your broader partners, to actually have them involved in, in the consideration of what's going in that plan. So I don't think it's one point. I think it's as you progress that you have that sense check with it. And that keeps that dialogue much more established with your partners as you're preparing it as well, rather than um, we'll, we'll post off a, I'm really going back in time here, we'll post off a version of the plan and see if anybody gets back. You know, it's we're not looking to do that anymore. We are looking to bring stakeholders together. Here's a really good process to bring them together around. Thank you. OK, good to see you, Keith. Good to see you too. <laughs> Thank you. If anyone else wants to come in, just please stick your hand up and I'll bring you in to speak. There was a question from before. Um, it's a bit of an unusual one. <laughs> It was from a marine planner, which I think there might only be one in the whole call. Um, it's probably directed to, uh, best to Tom and Laura, um, specifically about the data and, um, and where the project happened. Um, was there anything specific that stood, that stood out about um, co coastal information in the projects? Sorry, I'm paraphrasing the question, it's quite long. Um, Either data-wise, um, thinking about links to the well-being economy, green space spaces, and things like that, or just any other learning uh, for marine panels, uh, it's probably something we don't reach out to enough. Um, I've not got a huge contact list for marine panels. I don't know if anything's came of any discussions you've had, Laura or Tom, from, from either the data or the, the project work. Yep. So. Um... We've got a relationship. I reached out to Fraserburgh Harbour quite early on in the in in starting in post in Fraserburgh, recognizing for lots of reasons, employment, but also culture and identity. The harbour is huge for Fraserburgh. It is what they're known for, and they have a huge role to play in the success and development of Fraserburgh. Um, in terms of looking at um, development for young people around skills, training, and things like that that are linked to the harbour. So Tom definitely helped me with that to explore what the harbour meant to Fraserburgh, in a very data-led sense. So, um, you know where what op, um, employment opportunities was it offering um in terms of um different intermediate zones so we broke it down to that level how many people in different intermediate zones were employed by something to do with the harbor not not always just directly to the harbor but associated businesses with the harbor as well so that was really important for us to understand um and we brought the the representatives from the harbour into assessment discussions. Unfortunately, they couldn't attend, but they provided their, I met with them and they provided their comments around some of the assessments to the point now that they want to do an assessment themselves on their master plan. Timing wise, we'll see whether it works out um, before we wrap up in Fraserborough. But um, yeah, I definitely say it, it shapes lots of different aspects um, from my experience it's simple things like you're working in a town that you know two sides of it are surrounded by water so it it impacts on connectivity of it it impacts on the um sort of 
access to it but then it also impacts as I say in the the identity and the culture of the place it is a common theme for Fraserburgh the fishing that is what their identity has been built around they're very proud of it there's a lot of pride um, it has negative consequences because it's driven a lot of inequality. The people that have done very well in Fraserburgh from the fishing live in very nice houses in very nice parts of Fraserburgh. And the people that haven't been associated with the fishing potentially don't live in the very nice houses in the very nice part of Fraserburgh. So it's it's been a key aspect in lots of aspects, it being a coastal town. Um, interest, I'm sure Tom might want to come in, but interestingly, it, it's it's difficult at times as well because when we're looking at things like the briefings, there is there aren't very many places that are more beautiful than Fraserburgh, um, in, I would argue. It's absolutely stunning. The blue and green spaces are unreal. The beach is fantastic. These things are on the doorstep. People aren't accessing them. So there's a lot for us to understand what's going on there in terms of why people don't access them and the uniqueness of Fraserburgh's location. Again, the weather the horrific weather you know, for four months of the year, the, the locals describe it as the hellish winters. We, active travel and trying to encourage people to get out and walk on the streets that's difficult the weather the the bird fouling that you get on coastal towns that massively impacts it impacts on safety of walking around the pavements it impacts on the safety of walking up and down the steps it impacts on people's mental health when their town doesn't look nice because the bird fouling hasn't been cleaned up um the planting of the 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 types of plants that they have we've discussed that in the beach master plan what plants they're going to put in and around the beach area that can sustain the harsh winters and and you know the harsh weather conditions that you get on a so yeah Yes, in a very long-winded answer, yes, the, the location being a coastal town has a huge role to play f in lots of different aspects. From a data perspective, I don't know if Tom wants to jump in or not, but I know he's been involved in that. Yeah, no, I don't think I'll be able to add too much uh, beyond that, other than there are some measures like the 20, some of the data that's used within the 20-minute neighbourhoods does give indication of a proportion of the population that are within a certain um, distance to green open spaces. Now, that will vary naturally by by the topography of an area, but certainly how to get something that's going to work, particularly for for coastal towns or fishing towns, that we could delve into in a, with you know further time and, and, and introspection on this. But it's certainly you know the, the ask often prompts a slightly different way of looking at the data that opens another door for some new data. So certainly the you know, the, the example that Laura used around the the number of roles related to fishing, actually that that allowed us to get into a bit more of the no miss labor labor market statistics that we've utilized in other areas as well. So it's great to get those questions and how do we apply those specific questions to other towns or other learnings is is the real opportunity about programs like this. Okay, thank thanks very much both. I'm just aware of the time just now. We do have one more question which I'll 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 post up just now. Um. There was also, Laura did mention uh, master plan areas as well uh, during our answer, which is something I don't think we've got time to delve into in depth just now, but I would, uh, given the, the recently published master plan consent areas uh, uh, regs, it could be something that place and wellbeing outcomes really do fit into well. Um, so um, you should just see in your screen now a uh, question from, from the team, uh, just asking the audience. Uh, what more would help you to integrate the place and wellbeing outcomes into your work? Uh, really keen to see some, some some responses here because it will help uh, what what Irene and our team are doing to take things forward. So I'll leave that up for a few minutes. Uh, I don't know if Irene wants to come back in just now, um, but I just want to notice we have shared loads loads of links throughout today, and we will send an email round of what. Uh, with uh, the recording, with the presentations and everything that's been mentioned today, because there's a lot more links than we normally have during a two hour presentation, so a lot to take in. So uh, back to you, Eddie. Thank you. Yeah, just to thank everybody. It has, I realise, been a lot of information coming <laughs> and I've tried to break it up so it's not just me talking as well. But it is three years worth of, of work that has taken us to this point. So it's it's trying to give a bit of a flavour of all the aspects that are sitting there now as resources. And I think just having a look at our website and what is there and getting in touch, if there's anything that you think, I think that could potentially help us, then letting us know so that we can have that conversation. Um, 
it, it's it's the, it's a challenge to put it across. I, I get asked to describe it in the, the programme very quickly. And there's been so many elements to it that have fed in um, that, that I think we've got better at it as we've gone, but we're always developing it. And I think that the learning between our seven towns has been absolutely crucial, the confidence that that has given. And the fact that, you know, Tom has been able to go in and, and do a process in one town and then develop on it in the next town. And what we found is that our most recent town that we went into, Dalkeith, which was um, just um, a year ago in January that we went into, because we had done this process a number of times, we were able to go up and in and running, and we have produced all of those quantitative and qualitative reports and undertaken assessments at a far faster speed than we have in those initial towns where we were finding our feet and finding our way. We, we know our way around um, doing that now. And it's it was great to be able to go up to, to Shetland and, um, and support them and find that they actually had a lot of the data aspects already and they had recently been out and done a lot of work with their communities so they had that qualitative aspect so i think if you're looking at a place and well-being assessment it may not be that you've got the time to go and do the in-depth work but there's 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 elements of that there and that's the important element to make sure you're bringing into the assessment process um what are folks saying? A focused conversation. Yep, that 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 would be very welcome. I think it's it's getting a feel for how can we structure what we've got there in in a manner that that people are able to pick it up and use it. Um, a single evidence report data dashboard is the dream. Yes, it is. I would agree. Uh, both the place and well-being outcome indicators that we refer to um, back when we were talking about the place and well-being outcomes and that data that, that Tom has been preparing, they are if, if we could have not just planning authorities, but councils and other organisations able to go and easily access that, that would be the dream. For To have a bit of a spatial look to it, that would be my dream as well. And that is that is what we are working towards at the moment, is how can we find a platform, particularly if every planning authority in Scotland is going to be looking at the place and wellbeing outcomes as part of that national um, planning improvement work, then where can they all go to, to get access to those indicators and to get access to this data as well more easily um, so that we can be truly evidence and data informed. What else have we got? Exploring the alignment between and MPF4. Yeah, we've we have looked at the alignment and the place and well-being outcomes are all there within the national planning framework for the the each one of them is is sitting within it. The, the national planning framework will go beyond because a lot of aspects around climate. For us, it's that preventative role that place can take in still um reducing uh, net zero emissions and, and promoting sustainability is that input. And all of those outcomes, if you if you look through the national National planning framework are part of the framework are, and, and part of its ambitions as well. Okay, I think what I'll do there then is thank everybody very much for their time to thank Laura, Andy, Tony and Tom in particular for um, their contributions and for their insight and experience and being able to share that. Um, I hope everyone can go away and do a bit of a bit of a digest and have a little look at the website and there's the, the, the contact information for our web pages as well. So you can you can have a bit of a look around there. And if you're not finding what you, you thought you would, then then please do let us know, because setting out this amount of work in a, in a clear manner, we're very close to it. And maybe we're too close to it. So it would it would really help to to hear from others if they found it to be easy to access what they were after or not as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And uh, I'll give you back four minutes of your time. There we go. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>